So let me say that before we um, open the word this morning, uh, for those that are uh, tuned in to our broadcast, if you can just go into the chat box and kind of give us a hello just to see who's uh, tuned in this morning, and, um, and that would be a really greatly appreciated. Just say hello to us, and we want to say hello and welcome to you guys. Um, so thankful and grateful for, um, for what God is doing. Uh, we just constantly keep saying this, that uh, God is, is in our midst. He's constantly working. Um, and so we want to just keep pressing into that. So, uh, so, so grateful. I also want to say that um, uh, before we pray, that um, I, I'm speaking really for the elders as well, all of us. We're just so grateful for the way that God has just provided all of our, all, all of our needs. I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable uh, to see, uh, especially in the season that we've been the last eight, nine months, uh, God has richly blessed us abundantly. And so we're so grateful. Thank you to, uh, to you, family, uh, who commit and uh, believe and trust in the mission and vision of Living Water Church. And so uh, we're so grateful. So if this morning... Uh, you have um, uh, an offering or a tithe. Uh, you can actually uh, go to our website and and uh, and and tithe there. Or those who are here physically, you can uh, either give it to uh, me or Jonathan. And and so pray with me as we uh, uh, as we pray for the offering. Uh, God, we thank you, uh, Lord. We're just so so grateful for the way that you have provided for us. You're you're so faithful. I thank you for uh, our family, Living Water Church. And, Lord, I pray that um, as we present our tithes and offerings to you, Lord, we pray that that would multiply, uh, Lord, not for our glory, not for our gain, but for the kingdom's gain. And so, Lord, take all of um, the funds of the, of the offering, the tithes, Lord, that are given to you, Lord, may it be multiplied to increase your kingdom uh, here and abroad. And so, Lord, we love you. We pray that as we open your word this morning, we pray that you would speak to us change us, challenge us, encourage us, we pray. Get me out of the way this morning, Lord, as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Just kidding. <laughs> some of you are seated. Some of you are standing. That's all good. Hey, I'm excited about uh, this morning's message. It's pretty cool that as, we, uh, as I prepare, or whoever's preaching, really, even Pastor Jonathan, it's awesome that when we come and deliver the word, it's as a result of just God just stirring uh, our hearts. And I, I always like to say that, um, you know, before we really preach to other people, um, the prayer is that God would preach to us first. And so uh, that's really, um, as I begin this morning, this continued series of that we're going through in this Christmas season called the Christmas Star of Wonder. My prayer is that um, God would continue to first work in me and change me as I then bring his word this morning. Like last week, I want us to look at the significance of the star on the first Christmas. The wonder of the Christmas star is so much more than a decoration on top of a Christmas tree. To help you remember this, it's not a decoration, it's a declaration. The Christmas star is a declaration, a bold announcement, a, 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 a proclamation for those who call and live out Jesus as their King and Savior, the Bethlehem star is in fact a commitment to draw attention to Christ and also, like we talked about last week, to point others to Christ. And so Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to reread this passage. This is kind of the main passage for the next couple weeks leading up to Christmas. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign... <laughs> I love that God has a sense of humor. R-E-I-G-N, the rule of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose, and we have come to worship him. King Herod was deeply disturbed when he heard this, as was everyone in Jerusalem. He called a meeting of the leading priests and teachers of religious law and asked, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? In Bethlehem, in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet wrote. And this is a, this is a scripture quoting from Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the ruling cities of Judah, for a ruler will come from you who will be the shepherd for my people Israel. Of course, a foretelling of Jesus Messiah. 
Verse 7, then Herod called for a private meeting with the wise men, and he learned from them the time when the star first appeared. Then he told them, go to Bethlehem and search carefully for the child, and when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him too. After this interview, the wise men went their way, and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. The title of my message this morning is Questions on the Journey. Questions on the Journey. Last Sunday, we looked at the importance of pointing others to Jesus, especially uh, in this Christmas season. My prayer and desire this morning is to keep pointing you to Jesus. As well, my prayer is that you will do the same and point people to Jesus. You know, I mentioned this last week, the Bethlehem star, which is the aligning of Saturn and Jupiter, aligned into one beautiful bright star, the Bethlehem star, is in fact scheduled to take place in, uh, next week, next Monday, on December 21st. I don't think that this is a coincidence. I really believe that God is making himself more and more real to, uh, to the world. Jesus is in fact in control and is still in the business of showing himself real to the world. Jesus was born sometime between 6 and 4 BC. And so the question that I want to ask as we set the stage is, what was the cultural climate, climate at that time? What was, what, was, what was the environment when Jesus stepped in um, as, a, as a newborn baby? Well, the climate was full of violence. There was lawlessness. There was chaos. There was a lot of political and social unrest. And I think it's fair to say that when Jesus uh, was born, it was a very dark, dark period. The wise man found Jesus by way of the star, which was the meeting, the aligning of the stars, Jupiter and Saturn. They saw the star as it supernaturally rested on where Jesus was, and they, what? They began to worship him. In a time where it was dark, light was brought into our world. Jesus appeared in a very dark period of time and stepped into the chaos and brought peace. Uh, I like the way that John chapter 1 verse 14 reads uh, this. Uh, this is from the message. The word referring to Jesus, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. Fast forward to this year, 2020. We are living in some very dark times. It's a time of violence. It's a time of chaos and fear and political and social unrest and uncertainty. Kind of feels like the darkness really uh, seems to be increasing by the hour. December 21st is what's called winter solstice, which means that the day is the shortest and the night is the longest. It's literally the darkest day. And it is the beginning of what most would call the cold, dark winter season. But on the darkest day this year, Jupiter and Saturn will meet, giving us the Christmas star. How incredibly timely. God's incredible clear sign and confirmation to his people that in this very moment of time, during Christmas 2020, that we get to see this beautiful reality that even in the darkest of times, light will and has stepped in. In our chaos and fear, God is here and there. In our darkest time, he is there. He brings light and makes all things new. 
Light will, light will always prevail. Always, always prevail. Looking at the historical account of the wise men traveling to see the infant king, I want us to look at three questions that I thought about as I was uh, studying this week. I want us to look at these three questions that the wise men may have possibly asked before and also even during their trek to find the newborn king and also to worship him. And this is the first question that I thought about. Right before the wise men getting ready to start their trek, maybe they asked this question, how long will it take to get there in the dark? How long will it take to get there in the dark? Speaking of the dark, not too long ago, us men of Living Water Church got to participate in a men's retreat back in October, and we went up to beautiful Lake Tahoe. And um, our friend and family member of Living Water Church, Ernie Miller, who is a professional fisherman, I know he's tuned in. And, um, and so he actually, one, one morning, early morning, he caught this incredible rainbow trout. And uh, that evening, we a- he actually baked it, and we ate it, and it was unbelievable. And so the next morning, which was Sunday morning, I told Ernie, hey, Ernie, um, we should go back out to the lake early, early morning and let's, uh, let's fish, and let's see if I can outdo you. And uh, so we went out there at 4.30 or 5 a.m., and let me tell you, uh, church, it was absolutely dark. It was pitch dark. I mean, even our phone uh, flashlight didn't provide a sufficient amount of light as we were getting our, uh, you know, our, our bait together and luring up and all of that. And it was incredibly dark, but one thing I need to tell you, that morning, it was so incredibly uh, majestic looking up and seeing all the beautiful stars. I mean, literally, it lit up the dock as we were preparing to uh, to ca- cast out and fish and for me to get that big, big fish bigger than what Ernie Miller caught the morning before. And the truth is, is that that morning... I think the Lord just had a plan for Ernie and I to just enjoy God's creation and enjoy his majestic lighting up the star through uh, lighting up the sky through stars. And he and I didn't even get a bite and uh, which was okay because it was incredible fellowship being under the beauty and majestic creation of God. The journey from Parthia to Jerusalem is, imp- is approximately 500 miles. So I just want you to kind of picture this. I'm setting the buildings, building this as, as we, we can are considering this question that maybe the wise men asked as they started this trek, how long will it take to get there in the dark? So it's 500 miles from Parthia to Jerusalem. And with no major detours or disruption, this journey would have probably taken 50 to 60 days maybe even less. This means, now check this out, this means that for the majority of their journey, they were told to head east in the dark, figuratively, and also even physically, trusting that they would in fact find him. What were some of the things that maybe they were considering? Would this journey even be worth it? think 10, maybe even 20 days in, do you think that they maybe said, let's just stop and let's, uh, you know, let's turn back. It's kind of not worth it. We're tired of kind of walking aimlessly in the dark. The wise men almost certainly traveled by day and slept in tents by night. They dealt with the hot sun and dust with blisters and sore muscles and thirst and all the other discomforts of a long journey. Despite all the reasons to not continue, the wise men kept going, determined to worship the infant king. Do you know that many people today are experiencing this very same thing? Searching for God in the dark, metaphorically, physically, and, of course, spiritually. Searching, in some ways, in the dark, not being able to see, not even being able to understand. Ever feel like you're walking in the dark? You may be here this morning feeling that, here physically and also those who are tuned into our broadcast. 
You ever kind of felt like it seems like God is not the Savior and King that people kind of rave about during this season? Has the journey been too long in the dark? And so the question that maybe I want to ask you and me is, what signs are we looking for? You know, I've shared this story about my family and when I became born again at 12 and as a result, really, really passionate about sharing the love of Christ to my extended family and my grandma and grandpa are very, very close to me. And I, I really, especially my grandma, I, I just wanted her to know the love of Jesus. I wanted her to experience the, the, the life change and, and the incredible unconditional grace and love and mercy of God like we were experiencing as a family. And my grandma was very, very uh, adamant, especially during Christmas season. She, at the time, she just, you know, she just said, you know, leave your Jesus out of here. I, I know where this is Jesus' birth, but, you know, that's not, that's not something we bring into this house. We, we'll do the other traditions, but not that. And, you know, stop talking about your church and stop talking about your church family. You have a family, so why are you thinking that there's just some pretend family that's around you? You have family. And this was my grandmother. She was very cold in terms of spiritually speaking. I can say this, that she was in the dark. But, you know, God got a hold of her heart, and it was through a very, very difficult situation where my aunt was uh, really having some birth complications with my cousin. And uh, she came to me and our family, uh, us and our family, and she said, would you pray? Would you have your church pray? And unbeknownst to us during that time, she had made this promise to God. She said, God, if you're real, I promise that if you get Chipper, that was his, that's his name, if you get Chipper out of this and you spare him and you give him a life, I promise, I promise I will commit my life to you. Please show me a sign. Show me that you are, in fact, real. The story is that, in fact, uh, Chipper was saved. Uh, my aunt made it through. Everything was, was great. And Chipper, is in his, he's married and uh, uh, he's been a missionary serving in, a duck in uh, uh, several places. And, and, uh, and so as a result, my grandmother gave her life to Jesus while walking in the dark, asking a lot of questions, of course, and doubting. God showed up and showed her that she's, in fact, real and got a hold of her heart, and she became the most incredible evangelist for the sake of the gospel that I knew. She made it a rule in her home moving forward that if you're going to come into my home, you're going to hear about Jesus, and I'm going to pray for you. That's, my, that's the legacy of my grandmother, Arlene. You know, I like to say this, that we've, we've, we've said this church for several uh, months in this season that we're in, you know, God, would you just show yourself real? Would you, would you confirm to us the signs that you are with us and that you are, in fact, um, uh, uh, right here with us and you're confirming what we're pressing into and following you? And time and time again, God has proven himself to show that. We have experienced, you talk about signs here, I'm talking about lives, like we've seen changed lives, the testimonies of those who are even here physically the testimonies of what is that? That is the power of God in your life that's radiating and it's becoming contagious. We've seen baptisms, and I know, I know this season for baptism, it's a cold season, but man, if there's somebody that gives their life to Jesus, we're going to say amen and we're going to baptize them in Jesus' name. We've seen baptisms the last several months, and we've seen people commit their lives to growing deeper in God's word and even with questions, we, we know a number of people, especially our youth, who are saying, I want to know more of who God is. I want to know who Jesus is. You're talking about Holy Spirit. I, I don't know what that is. We, I want to learn more about that. And so we've got pockets of people in twos, threes, and fours who are hungry to know God. And this is not a competition when it comes to church. We say, look, we're all on a different journey, but we're all going to the same place to grow in deeper communion and community and love of Jesus Christ. You know, for many, I'd say that it's not a faith issue, it's a surrender issue. We know that God is real. We have that in our vision. If, you know, real people serving a real God. Yes, we know that in the midst of a lot of facade and, 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 and what may come off is, as, 
as something to worship or someone to worship. We say we worship the true living God. You know, for many, it's not a faith issue. It's simply a surrender issue. And so the question that I want to have is here is, is will you just simply surrender your heart, surrender your life, and give him all of who you are? You know, once in Jerusalem, depending on how, lo- how long the wise men stayed there, the trip to, Be- uh, to Bethlehem, again, with no detours or disruptions, would have only taken about two hours. So they, so they go about 50 to 60 miles. Uh, I'm sorry, 50 to 60 days. They get into Jerusalem. They're still unsure. Uh, and they get to Jerusalem. Jesus is in Beth- Bethlehem. And so for that trek is, you know, what scholars say is about two hours. I want to say this, that it's, it's easy to forget that for almost their entire journey, and you have to set aside our traditions and some of the things that we've kind of embraced. But it's easy to forget that for almost the entire journey of the wise men, they did not follow the star. Why? Because the star was not in the sky. It actually appeared only on the night that Jesus was born. The Bethlehem star supernaturally showed up in the last two hours in their journey. What an incredible picture and application to you and I that the majority of our journey often feels like and is in the dark. But man, God is so faithful that he says, you know, when we when we really full of anxiousness and anxiety and even discouragement and depression, we say, how will we get there in the dark? Let me tell you, church, God will show up. He will show up. He always shows up because Jesus is the light. A powerful passage of scripture, John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said this, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. He is the one that provides life. My challenge to all of us is is to know and experience the fact that Jesus is the bright star in the darkness. The second question that I, I thought about that maybe the wise man considered Uh, before the trek or even during the trek was, what will we do once we see the newborn king? What will we do once we see the newborn king? What we know is this, is that once the wise men actually saw Jesus, the historical account, the scriptures say that they bowed and worshiped him. Sometimes when it comes to reading God's word, we, we kind of know everything that's, that's happened. And so we lose our context and we, under, we, we lose some of the in- anxiousness and the questions that they may have asked leading up to that. But yes, they in fact, once they saw Jesus, they, they did bow and they did worship him. They found Jesus as the true radiant Light and life, eternal life, more than just this life, eternal life into their hearts. And so what was their response? They saw the star first before they set eyes on the Christ child. When they saw the star from afar off, they were filled with joy. They were dancing like similar to what went on out here in in the rain here physically uh, those who are uh, at home, it was a, a sight to behold. Actually, lots of dancing and joy. It was unbelievable. I mean, kind of like getting into this picture, like into this story. Like they were filled with joy when they saw that star. They worshiped Jesus before they even saw him. Okay, I know that that can preach really um, like several sermons, but I just want to just kind of camp a little bit. Listen, they worshiped Jesus before they even saw him. They worshiped him. They said, we're going over there, and God shows up supernaturally, says, this is where my son is. I'm going to put a star right here supernaturally and divinely, and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna see that, and you're going to be filled with joy because God is faithful always, always, 
But there's something to be said about worshiping Jesus before we actually see him. You know, when, uh, when my two sons, and I know those who, of you who are parents, you know, when, my, when my, both of my sons, especially my oldest son, I mean, my first, you know, our first uh, newborn for our, uh, for our family, you know, I was, when, when, when Connor and Rylan were born, it was this overwhelming sense of, like, awe. It was like not knowing what the future held in that moment as I hold this baby but knowing that life will never be the same, it was like this, wow, like this overwhelming sense of joy and uncertainty. And uh, what am I supposed to do? It was unbelievable. Maybe that's what the wise men experienced similar in, in terms of when they saw Jesus, the king. But, you know, somebody else, um, when, I, when it comes to, you know, uh, this, this point of, you know, them worshiping Jesus before they even saw him. Thomas was one who doubted until he saw Jesus for himself. John chapter 20 in verse 24 says, One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. In other words, he was alive. He had resurrected. But he replied, Thomas replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed, then Jesus told him this, you believe because you have seen me. Listen, blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Blessed are those who, who believe without seeing me. What will the wise men do when they see the newborn king? Their commitment in faith was awe and worship. It was the result of them saying, we will worship the newborn king. We will, we will worship him now, even before we see him. And when we do, that will just be the completeness of it. My challenge in this point is faith in Jesus, belief in Jesus as Savior and King is not mindless. It's not setting aside your brain and mindless because you're believing in Jesus, who oftentimes we do not see. It's not a blind faith. In fact, it's quite the opposite. God challenges our faith and trust in him by saying, will you just simply follow me even though you do not know what's ahead of you? That's how God builds that trust and that faith in him. The last question that I want to uh, leave with you in considering this journey that the wise man took, maybe they asked this question, who will you tell about seeing the newborn king? Who are you going to share with about what we just saw, the newborn king? You may think that this question may be a stretch, that the wise men might have asked this question before or even during their journey. Who will you tell about seeing the newborn king? When the wise men reached their destination, when they got into the city of Jerusalem, they started asking everyone that they met, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. And guess what? Nobody knew what they were talking about. What are you, what are you talking about? I mean, the wise men went to the palace and inquired of King Herod where they might find this king of the Jews, a king so noteworthy that a star had been placed in the sky to celebrate his birth. Did the wise men think that they would ever end up sharing of all people with King Herod about the real king? And King Herod's response, he was completely flabbergasted. He was stunned. No king of the Jews had been born. There was no baby in the palace. Who were these fall, uh, fools coming in and upsetting the whole city and demanding to worship a baby king that didn't 
even exist. What was the result? King Herod told the wise men to let him know where he could worship the king too, only to find out, of course, that he had a different motive. We find it in the uh, verses following Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and uh, under based on the wise men's reports of the star's first appearance. Here's my point. I want to encourage you, church, do not be surprised by the opposition by the hostility and even the doubt you face when you share about King Jesus. But this should never stop us ever to stop uh, from sharing. It should never, ever stop us from sharing. You know, when I became born again, God just got a hold of my heart. And I got so gripped by that God would love me and that he would have a plan for my life. So much so that I wanted everybody to know. So I got on my bike and I just went door to door. I just wanted to give like tracks of like just, you know, John 316, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I just was so gripped and I had to do something. I had to share it. And so I literally got on my bike, went door to door, knocked on doors and said, I just want to give you this. And God loves you. I'm telling you, every single person slammed the door in my face. They slammed the door in my face. It wasn't like, you know, I wasn't like selling like Boy Scout cookies. It was, it was literally like, what are you doing here? Like, get out of here. Um, I want to share um, a, a brother, a family member of ours, uh, Marcus, who's here with his kids. Marcus Foster over there. Love you, brother. You know, not too long ago in July, God got a hold of his heart, and that had been a series of things that God was doing in his life. I'd ask Marcus if I could share this, and he said, amen, yes, Absolutely. And Marcus, it's been amazing to see what God has been doing in his life. He's a, he's a walking example of the power of God. Somebody who really strived after trying to find happiness in his life until he gave his life to the Lord, got filled by the Holy Spirit. You know, it's been amazing. When he got baptized, his testimony was, you know, I, I just want to let the world know of my commitment to Jesus Christ. And, you know, sometimes and in the time that uh, that's happened, you know, it's been a little bit of a challenge. You know, sometimes you get ostracized by your family when you when when people all of a sudden see you as different and, and they start asking questions like, well, wh- I mean, what's going on? Like you, you must be you must be pretending there must be something like like that's I don't know, like what do you like what's happening? And all you can give testimony to is the fact of the power of God and the transformation of a heart. And, and, and you just have to just simply just say, it's God, it's, he's doing it. And, and then the patience that comes with that to just let that continue. And sometimes the opposition or the doubt looks like that. It's opposition or you, or you get ostracized by your family. You're certainly even questioned, you know, is God that real in your life or are you just playing a game? Are you just pretending? I want to end this message this morning by simply asking all of us these questions. What questions do you have this morning about who Jesus is and the Christmas story? Is the journey becoming tiresome as you have exhausted all the things in your life to find what a right relationship with God truly is and what it means to have meaning and purpose and vision in your life? You know, what difference does this make in our life here in 2020? How relevant is it all in this year, 2020, of what I would say, trying to not over embellish it, but we've all been experiencing this year of disaster and turmoil and increasing darkness. How relevant is all this? And where can you turn your attention to? Our attention can always and will always be turned to the king who sits on the throne today, who loves you, who cares for you, wants you to be in the family of God and in community with one another. John 12, verse 46 says, I, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, I have come as a light to shine in this dark world so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. Let's pray.
God, I'm so grateful that you are, in fact, the light that shines in the darkness. Uh, Lord, as I think about what that looks like, Lord, it's not like it's not like when the light comes and shines over the darkness. It's not like the darkness now is losing. Lord, when it comes to the light of Christ, it's not even a competition. It's not even in the same uh it's not even the same competitive game. Lord, the light always wins. The light always shines in the dark. I pray, God, that as we continue to follow you, Lord, oftentimes it seems like we're, we're just kind of sometimes blindly uh, following you. Lord, sometimes we get frustrated because we don't, we don't know where you are, and we get anxious because we, we want to follow you with all of our hearts and our minds and our souls, and and, and we get anxious, and the enemy likes to try and steal, steal that, Lord, and have guilt on us because we're not doing it right. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would bind the enemy who would seek to steal the mind and stop the heart from walking and following you. God, afresh this morning, I pray it as a church, Lord, as a community, Lord, that we would, we would just recommit, Lord, and fully commit our lives to you, Lord, knowing that you have, in fact, sacrificed your life, God, given us life and life to the fullest, knowing that we will see you someday and we will be with all who have followed you in the past, Lord. We'll, we, will, we will find you. We will see you. And in this journey, Lord, that we're on, we will follow you. And in this Christmas season, God, give us the opportunity Lord, from our neighbors and friends and family, Lord, give us those opportunities, Lord, to share the love of Jesus, the light of Jesus. Lord, we, we're so grateful that we can be worshiping you here this day. Nothing is going to stand in the way, Lord, of our worship to you. Rain, sickness, pain, sorrow, we're going to be together and we're going to worship you. We are committed to you afresh and anew this morning. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.